This video is sponsored by Squarespace. More on that in a bit. Bonjour, my name is Alice. Welcome back to my channel. Today I want to start by going full parasocial and tell you about a vlogger that I really, really enjoy watching. Her name is Leah. She runs the channel Leah Fields Nerd, and she's really cool in my opinion. What interests me today with Leah is how her channel evolved through time. I discovered her at a time where her content was more that girl focused. By that I mean that she produced way more routine, productivity based videos. She never fully fit with the that girl stereotype though, because self care was the end goal. You know, the girl boss aspect of that girl wasn't really there. Her vlogs really stood out for me because of the attention she gave to details, you know, the, the frames, the light, the story. She's one of those people who turn vlogging into art. Recently, Leah's content has changed. Two months ago, she released a video titled I Chose the Slow Life, in which she stayed with a British family, learned about farm life, permaculture, spent time with animals, played the piano, etc. As a viewer and as a fan, it was amazing to see Leah look so fulfilled. Slow living now seems to be a recurring theme of her videos. In another one of those videos, Leah goes on walks with her grandma before going on a walk by herself to see the sun reflect on the water, wandering the library, decluttering, work on something creative, making her own calendar with her illustrations. Finally, in her more recent video as I'm speaking, Leah opened up about the expectation to be productive, be social at the time when she was in Paris. One last creator that I like to keep in touch with is Unjaded Jade. So she created this concept of casual magic, which I really love. It's the idea of purposely living in the moment and finding magic in the little things. I know it sounds very cheesy, but you know, a casual magic moment for me now is when I go on walks uh, in the Gothic area here in Barcelona, and I turn off Google Maps and just wander and sometimes I end up in tiny dark serpentine streets that can make you feel kind of claustrophobic and then all of a sudden a square opens up in front of me and it's big and it's bright and it's magical. Slow living has become an alternative to hustle culture now. You know, it's revolutionary in a way because it demands courage to step up and embrace it in a world where one's value is very much tied to one's productivity. Embracing slow living is for many a journey where they unlearn everything they've been taught about the need for growth, the need for competition, and that is beautiful to see. Also, in many aspects, slow living is anti capitalistic. Yeah, you saw me coming there, but we'll go back to that later. My goal with this video is to convince you that first, low living is a good thing, but that the way we see it now is limited because it's based on a lifestyle choice, individual choosing slow living. So I think we can use this trend to bring another discussion to the table, one where slow living isn't a lifestyle choice, but an incentive, a right, or even a social project. But before we continue, I'd like to introduce you to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. You can create your own website around your preferred aesthetic from a catalogue of templates and use it as a landing platform for all the activity you do. YouTube, online shop, blog, podcast, photography, etc. Once that is set up, you can connect all your social media accounts and share content between different platforms. Squarespace can also help you create effective email campaigns to really connect with your community. Finally, they have this very cool feature where you can connect and learn from other creators like Adrien Raquel, who will show you how you can best use the platform. If you feel like Squarespace is made for you and you want to check it out, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you've experimented and you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring the video and now let's go back to it. So first I would like to point to one problem I see with the way slow living is understood at the moment, namely its rejection of the city. One example of that is the Cottage Fairy, who is a little YouTube gem who regularly shares moments of her life in her cottage in the mountains. The Cottage Fairy is pretty much the definition of slow living. She seeks to cultivate a feeling of abundance while living simply, and in order to do so, she felt she had to live the city. The thing is that we can't all collectively move to the countryside, you know, it's, it's not possible demographically speaking. So while it does sound feasible to do that on an individual level with a little bit of skills and resources, it cannot be a societal project. That means that ultimately slow living turns into something that we consume, we romanticize, rather than something we experience. 
So how do we bring slow living in the city? Well, there are small initiatives done by organizations, businesses, and city dwellers. The Brooklyn Grange is one of them. They brought farm life to New York City. Maybe you've seen some of those cafes that refuse that people bring laptops during the weekend. That's another option. Those types of initiatives work very well with urban liberals and leftists who are willing to put time and effort into it or to go to those cafes and follow the rules. These are what we could call private solutions. They are offered by businesses and they need clients to function. That's also why they only attract a certain demographic of people. So again, how do we bring slow living to all people living in the city? And let's also add the suburbs to that. One thing you quickly realize when you learn about urban politics is that if you just ask people to do something, unless they are British, they won't do it. You have to create infrastructures, incentives for people so that it is not costly or even beneficial for them to do the things you want them to do. In France, for example, it is forbidden to work on Sundays, if you didn't know that already, um, except in certain industries and for independent workers. It was decided to force people to relax on Sundays because if they don't do it, Many will continue to work and others will feel guilty for not working. France has also decided recently to make it illegal to send work emails outside work hours. So these are two laws, incentives that favor slow living. But now we're coming to the big problem and something that no law or regulation can really change. Slow living or anything that is remotely connected to anti-work is immediately called lazy. I don't know if you remember, but when there was the I don't dream of labor movement, uh, the quiet wedding movement, when those movements gained momentum, people, bosses, hustle bros, uh, neoliberals, conservatives as well, called those people lazy, as if it was the biggest insult possible. Every time I make a video on anti-work, hustle culture, I always receive a bunch of comments telling me that I'm lazy, that leftists are lazy, and it really annoys me because I actually need to tell you a little story here. Uh, personal story. I do it because it's relevant to the topic, something that for a very long time prevented me from fully identifying as a leftist. And yeah, I'm sure the people will relate to it, or at least learn something from that experience. I've always been achievement driven, and I have to constantly be stimulated with projects, learning, activities. I love discovering new things, meeting new people, learning about their life experiences, discovering new ideas. And I often get asked on Instagram, how do you do all those things? And it's true that part of it is um, self-discipline. But for me, and that's my personal experience with it, self-discipline has never been torture. Instead, I see it as a tool that allows me to do all those activities, all those things I want to do, that in turn makes me feel um, happy and fulfilled. I remember as a kid, I would get grumpy if there was even just one weekend that wasn't filled with activities like, I don't know, going for a long walk, going to the beach, um, a museum, whatever. I remember those feelings of sadness and loneliness when my sister or dad didn't want to come with me on a bike ride or play Harry Potter in the forest or when nobody wanted to listen to me talk about uh, bird species for hours or why axolots are so cool. <laughs> Most of the time I was doing those things all by myself and it was fine, you know, like I'm, I'm okay being by myself. <laughs> when I was depressed as a kid, I'm actually getting emotional. Why am I getting emotional? I don't want to make it seem like my childhood was all fun and adventures, but having access to the outdoor, which is in itself a privilege, and um, filling my time with activities with, le with learning really helped me um, to be a happy kid, despite everything that was happening in my life. I'm still on my period, so maybe that's why I'm getting emotional. Now, because I am like that since I was a kid, I've always been fascinated by people who are achievement-driven, who do and know a lot of things. As a teenager and young adult, the people I related to the most on YouTube were liberals like Johnny Harris, Ezra Klein, who founded Vox. I didn't relate to their political views, I didn't find them radical enough, but I related to their lifestyle, to their passion for the work they do, the knowledge they have, and their self-discipline. On the other hand, and left-wing content was very anti-work, anti-hustle culture, and while I fully agree uh, with the critics made and have made similar critics in my own videos, I kept feeling like something was missing from the conversation. That those criticisms tended to reinforce the idea that left-wing people are lazy. And it's only about two, three years ago when I started learning about the Black Panther Party that I understood why I felt that way. I quickly became fascinated by the Panthers because they were devoted body and soul to their cause.
because they had a great work ethic, they trained, they read, not because they wanted to self-improve as hustle bros do, but because they were on a mission. They wanted to start a revolution. I also really enjoyed reading a landmark sociology book called Body and Soul Notebooks of an Apprentice Boxer, in which French sociologist Loïc Vacan moved to Chicago and trained with the black community there. It was interesting to see how these people used self-discipline, discipline, discipline on, on the body to actually politicize their bodies, as well as their minds. And finally, I more recently read anarchist Emma Goldman's autobiography, which is just as inspiring. I felt validated by what I was reading because I was coming across um, the stories of people whose personalities I related to. I understood that the problem wasn't that I liked self-discipline and a good work ethic. The problem was that those values had been gatekept by the right. Work had been gatekept by the right. So much that being pro-work and left-wing seemed like a contradiction. And sure, you could say that historically left-wing movements have always fought to work less, so obviously work is not something they value. But by saying that, we refuse to look at the whole picture and see what they fought for instead. And that poses the very important question of what do we mean by work? Too often work is understood as the 9 to 5 job. It's an activity one does, a service one provides, in exchange of money. That's the dominant view of work. It's also through this view of work that workers understand their value as individuals. For example, girlboss feminists like Facebook CEO Sheryl Sandberg reduces a woman's value in life to work and having babies. Sandberg never considers the importance of an emotional and political life. I sometimes wonder if that is something people like her even conceptualize, you know. I'm not saying she's dumb. What I'm saying, like Mark Fisher said in his book Capitalist Realism, is that she's so deep into that capitalist ideology that I wonder if she even considers other ways of seeing the world. That is precisely what left-wing movements fight for to shake the foundations of that capitalist ideology. I shared this picture on Instagram on the 31st of January. Um, it was the second day where French people went on strike to oppose Macron's retirement reform that delayed the age of retirement by two years. This reform is objectively unjust. It forces people whose jobs are already tiring, physically costing, to work even longer, knowing that many of those people won't even live to the day they'll be able to retire. It adds two years of capitalist work to all French people to improve France's competitiveness on the global market. In other words, it frames capitalist work as the only value workers can bring to the economy, to society, and that is ideological. There are many different ways one can produce value outside capitalist work. Feminists have historically pointed at the free work women do as procreators, uh, caregivers and housekeepers. Within the anarchist movement, the notion of work often expands to things like growing your own food, creating art, writing, volunteering, things that aren't financially compensated but are still very beneficial for society. This vision of work, which is way more inclusive and honest, is getting increasingly popular in and outside left-wing circles. In slow-living content, for example, you see that productivity, um, habits are redefined. They no longer mean having to wake up at 5 a.m. doing this and this and that, but rather to help someone get into the process of being creative, learning, etc. Slow living influencers like Leah and many others understand the value of those other forms of work. They experience a different type of growth. During the protests that took place in France, some people didn't identify to any political party. Others were protesting for the first time in their lives. And when those people protest against the delay of the age of retirement, they do not protest against work for laziness. They protest so that individual can also have time to explore other forms of work, creative, educational, political, that do not have an intrinsic economic value. Slow living, which politically manifests itself in demands for a full day work week, in shorter work days, for decreasing the age of retirement, is not laziness. It is necessary for restoring a sense of community. It is necessary in the context of the climate crisis where capitalist growth is damaging. We desperately need to reconnect with one another. But how can we connect with our partner, family, colleagues, people in our neighborhood, or even strangers, if our existence is reduced to capitalist work? How can we connect when mere suburbs are designed in a way that isolate people onto themselves, onto their families? How can we connect when access to art, education, sports are becoming more and more of a privilege? 
You know, I came across this idea recently that uh, gyms had privatized sports in a way, that free outdoor sports structures where people could connect uh, meet were disappearing. It's the same thing with gardens, you know. Why do we have a bunch of private little gardens? You know, this thing says so much about our culture, our society. The question now is, do we really want more of that? Or do we actually want that at all? As I said earlier, I currently live in Barcelona and I'm struck by the amount of squares that exist here where kids, teenagers and even adults play, meet, chat. It's not that complicated, you know. You create the structures for people to meet and do activities together. You give people the time to actually do activities together and things will naturally happen. We're social creatures. We need community to be happy and fulfilled. I listened to The Seed by Aurora when I was writing this whole part, so sorry if it sounds a bit dramatic, but you know, it has to be. I will conclude this now very messy, but a very dear to my heart video by asking you to really make an effort to reframe slow living as growth, to ditch capitalist realism, see the potential for human growth, not economic growth. That is ahead of us if we reduce capitalist work or get rid of it altogether. I know a lot of French people also watch my videos and I wanted to tell them that it really felt amazing to see all those people going on strike on the 31st. 2.8 million people, that's historical, that's very beautiful to see. You know me, I'm not the best um, agent of French soft power, but you know, that's the sort of soft power we want to have. And so I hope these pictures, um, as well as this little video, will inspire you to rethink slow living, to politicize it. And yeah, that's it for today, I guess. I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, the conversation continues in the comment section. Don't forget to like, to subscribe, if it's not done already. I'd like to thank Squarespace for sponsoring the video and a big thank you to my Patreons with a special thanks to Donage, Alex, Sam, Manuel, Dakota, Jay, Carla, Benjamin, Oswald and Perry. Other than that, yeah, I'll see you very soon. Probably in two weeks. Maybe one week, but more likely to be two weeks. Salut! Am I the only person that has to calm their arm has? You know, these ones get wild sometimes. <laughs>